Hello, everyone. Thank you for being patient. Um, we're going to get started now. So I'm Kishwai Rizvi. Um, I'm a professor of Islamic mm -hmm. art and architecture at Yale University. And I'm delighted to invite you to join us in Trust and Translation, the story behind Welcome to the New World. The event today takes place with the support, and I'm going to read this out, um, of the Yale Program on Refugees, Forced Displacement, and Humanitarian Responses, the University of Connecticut Human Rights Institute, the Modern Languages Department at Santa Clara University, and the Ignatian Center also at Santa Clara. Our conversation today is about a family escaping the Syrian civil war and arriving in the United States in November 2016 at a time of her presidential election like no other. And here we are four years later amidst even greater uncertainty and a time of even more suffering across the world. We can hope for better days ahead. But let me step back with a very brief timeline. The spring of 2011 is understood as the start of the Syrian civil war in which opposition forces sought the overthrow of the government of Bashar al-Assad. According to estimates by the United Nations, more than 400,000 people have been killed in Syria since the start of the war. As of April 2020, roughly 5.6 million people have fled the country, according to the United Nations Commission for Refugees, and more than 6.2 million people are displaced internally. In the midst of the unfolding humanitarian disaster, members of the Aldaban family were undertaking an exodus away from their familial city of Homs via Jordan in 2012 to the United States in 2016. They were assisted along the way with the US Refugee Admissions Project, which brought them here to New Haven, Connecticut. Welcome to the New World follows from the groundbreaking and Pulitzer Prize winning comic strip of the same name in the form of a new graphic novel by Jake Halpern and Michael Sloan. It tells the story of the family as they arrive in Connecticut and how they negotiate a new beginning in a foreign land. The book is as much about Syria as it is about American life today, marked as it is by overseas wars and their attendant political repercussions and displacements. The refugee crisis is a global trauma Yet in the book, it's seen through the eyes of one family um, and their experience. The process of translation, that which is the lens through which we want to have our conversation today among people as well as the process itself requires trust. Trust, trust between the protagonists that you see on the screen today, but also the medium, writing, language, and communication. And so I'm really, really happy to invite you to join us. I'm happy to have with us Jake Halpern, the author of the book, Mohammed Kadala, the translator and intermediary, and of course, Naji Aldaban, um, who I finally had the pleasure of meeting. So welcome all of you. Before we get started, I'll do a quick official introduction. Um, although, like I said, our protagonists, if you've read the book, you might know them well already. Jake Halpern contributes to the New York Times and the New Yorker and teaches writing at Yale and is the winner of the 2018 Pulitzer Prize. Naji is a senior at, at Hall High School in West Hartford. He's told his story at schools, churches, synagogues in Connecticut and elsewhere. And we're really, really happy to have you here. And last but not least is Mohammed Kadala, who is also from Homs, Syria, um, and is finishing his PhD at the University of Connecticut. He's a Fulbright scholar who came to the US in 2011 and is currently teaching Arabic at Santa Clara University in California. So we're going to start with you, Jake. I'd like you to take us through this process and tell us where the idea of the book begins and tell us who the protagonists are. Yeah, thank you, Kishwar. Well, it, it really began almost exactly four years ago to the day. Uh, I was reporting a story for the New York Times on a kind of unusual idea that it would be a graphic narrative, a true comic. My friend Michael Sloan would be the illustrator and I would report the story. 
So I reached out to Chris George at Iris here in Connecticut, they're the Refugee Resettlement Agency. And Chris said, hey, Jake, I've got a family. They're arriving on election day. This is 2016. They're the Aldevans, they're two brothers. Why don't you go down there with Michael and see the family when they arrive? And then you can always circle back and see if they agree to participate in your project. So I showed up on election day. Uh, Naji was 15 at the time. I like to joke with him. He was he was much skinnier. He's he's discovered the gym since then, so he's bulked up. And I basically just waved at Naji across a darking parking lot and said, "I hope to see you again." And met your your mom and dad, Adiba and Ibrahim. And that was it. And I went home that night, checked the New York Times website around 2:30 in the morning. I mean, it was oddly deja vu for this week. And Trump is doing much better than expected, and he's won the election. And my first thought really was of Naji and his family, and I thought wow, they, they landed in one country and they're gonna wake up tomorrow in another. And the added dr drama for their family was is that Naji's grandmother, as he'll tell you, and some of his aunts and uncles were still in Jordan trying to come to the US. And by Trump becoming president, the door was effectively closed for the time being. So I knew I needed a translator. I had not yet had the honor to meet my now good friend, Mohammed Kadala, but I had a friend, uh, an artist in New Haven, a Syrian American named Mohammed Hafez, and I called up Muhammad and I said, I think I need someone to go with me to meet this family and serve as an intermediary. And Muhammad said to me very bluntly, he said, Jake, I, I respect what you're trying to do, but I'm gonna be honest with you that I think that it's unlikely to succeed. The odds are against it. You're not Syrian, you don't speak Arabic, you're not Muslim. I've worked with families that are refugees here and, and I'm all those things. And it's taken me years to break through. Uh, in, in effect, I think the language and cultural and all the other barriers will be such that you're not going to get the kind of intimacy that you need. I mean, almost talked me out of it, um, but fortunately didn't. And eventually I connected through Chris George with Mohammed Kadala, and we went out uh, uh, to the Aldabon home. They were living in Manchester, Connecticut at the time, and we visited them. And uh, luckily they were incredibly gracious hosts. They took us in, they started telling the story, but I was watching Naji. And what caught my eye was, is that when all the other kids were in the other room, Naji was always staying with his mom and dad to the point where even the co-sponsors were saying, why doesn't Naji go play with the other kids? And I remember asking you, Naji, early on, why don't you? And your English was not that great. And I didn't have Muhammad around at the time. And you said, basically to me, Jake, I stopped being a kid when I was 10 years old. And we kind of had to leave it there because I didn't have, the, there wasn't the moment to kind of go there, but it, it lodged in my memory as, wow, this kid has a story. And so we're going to do a little bit reverse order. I don't actually get really into Naji's story in, as a reporter for many, many months, and it's with the help of Muhammad, and we're going to hear about that in a second. But before we do, we're going to fast forward for a sec because I want you to just hear from Naji a little bit about what that was. And there actually was a very good reason why he said that to me. So Naji, can we just start and we'll do a little kind of mini interview, almost reenact a little bit of what of the conversation we eventually did have. So what happens, Naji? You're 10 years old, you're living in homes, you have a pretty good life and um, civil war breaks out and your dad is taken by the security forces and you're left with your mom and your three younger siblings. And just kind of getting us up to speed, you end up at your grandmother's house. You all take refuge there. And your grandmother pulls you aside to have a conversation with you. Your grandmother, you call her Yuma. Uh, and can you just, let's just start there. Tell us a little bit about what Yuma said to you in that moment when she had this talk with you. Yeah, sure. Um, she basically, she brought me and uh, with my other cousin who was a little older than me, who was, uh, who was left, you know, after all of my uncles and my dad was taken to uh, custody. She basically just told us, like, you're the man of the house now. Um, you have to take care of all the rest of us. If anyone needs, if, the, if we need food, you have to bring it. If we need protection, you have to be there. And that really, to me, it basically meant that if military came and they want to do harm to, to any of our family, we would have to stop and we would have to, you know, fight that back. That's what, what it meant to me. And your grandmother gave you some very specific things to do. She she had you go out into the streets. Can you talk about what, what your responsibilities were? 
we we had to go um we had to get bread we had to get food in in a in a time where there was no stores um there was like one one time a bakery opened up for people and people stood in the line and uh, i was there with my cousin and my sister amal and uh, we were ready to get bread and suddenly someone from the back started shooting and i can never forget a lady was standing right in front of me she got shot and she fell right in front of me people started running jumping over her the only thing that i thought about is of my sister and my cousins i need i wanted to find them first because I, you know of what my grandma said yeah we have to protect them the first thing i thought of is finding them and even though it was shooting all around i was running around just to find them and as soon as i found them we started running i didn't even think of you know protecting myself trying to hide and uh, after i found them and you know we we ran we my mom and my my grandma they were all in the street they were afraid it was it was a very scary scene i just want to remind people that are listening at the time naji was 10 years old and that makes me want to ask you naji what does this do to you at age 10 like how do you process that at such a young age it's 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 a lot that's you know that's what i can basically say you have to take things that you're not supposed to at that age you're not supposed to be running and and shots are behind you you're not supposed to think that um when when someone comes with a gun to hurt your family you go and you hold the gun from him and you shoot him you know all that i had to think about it and be prepared for you know whenever it happens and it's just it really affects like even in the long term it changes the person and it really affects so you and your family eventually um make it out of your dad is released from prison um he comes home and says that he thinks you need to go uh to jordan uh, and but in fact he's right up to the end he's very worried you're on the bus together and at one point he says to you what should what you should do in the event that he's taken off the bus can can you tell us about that he said we were on the bus and he said you know if if, if they stop the bus and they take us down um just keep going go to jordan uh at least you're safe and if i can leave again i'll i'll, I'll follow you and once i heard that i i basically you know in, in between me and myself i said that if he goes down i'm going down with him at least i will try to take him from them try to stop at them somehow but i never thought of actually staying in the bus and going without him and luckily it turns out your dad does not get taken off the bus you make it to jordan you get there but jordan is not so easy for you because um you're hoping to go to school there and can you explain what happens yeah we we really thought like you know we're going to jordan um we're going to start you know safe life we're going to you know at least go back to start what we what we've lost i wasn't able to go to school i when i went to school um every day i would get beat beaten up by the kids and they would say you're syrian what are you doing here you stole our jobs you stole our houses um i would get beaten from teachers you know they would say oh you're missing homework but you know i would know that it's more like because they don't like syrians and all that i would come every day home you know i told i i have marks on my body on my face uh from getting beaten and my dad wouldn't be able to do anything about it i mean if if he goes to to report it or somewhere there is a possibility that we, they uh, deport us back to syria so at some point you become fixated on your idea for what the family needs to do like the one thing they need to do and can you explain to us what that was the going to the yeah uh, um the us was the only um way out of this so it was a a big uh, situation where where we our family had to split you know our family always been together in the war we left syria together and now we are in a point where like our future is separating so we would have to leave my grandma my uncle and his family my dad was you know on and off you know he starts saying like we should wait for them and and see you know we should say, tell them that we don't want to go now we want to wait for the rest of our family and to me that meant not going to the us not going to school and you know it's basically losing my future 
And just to be clear here for people who are listening, the reality was is that Naji's family and his uncle and his grandmother had all gotten uh, clearance to come to the U.S. But there were other, um, his, his other aunt, his other uncle had not. And the grandmother basically said, I'm not splitting up the family. So Naji's dad, Ibrahim, was put in this very difficult situation where Naji is telling him with a lot of good reason, we have to go to America. And your dad is feeling that he's abandoning his mom back in Jordan. It sounds like it was, must have been a very difficult situation, Naji. Definitely. I mean, sometimes uh, we got into arguments where like I felt my dad hated me on that time. I mean, I'm trying to take him away from his family and his, uh, his mom is saying, no, we have to stay together. It was a very tough time. So just to kind of get us back up to the rest, to, to, to the story that we started and back to Muhammad, our translator, I didn't know a lot of this. I didn't know almost any of this for not just when I showed up at their door, but for the first few months, because I didn't have the intimacy in the family where I felt I could just pull aside a 15 year old kid and ask them a bunch of questions and there was language barriers. Um, but this was something that I, I sensed from that first meeting where he, where he intimated that I'm not a kid, I haven't been a kid. And so there I really relied from the start on uh, my translator, Muhammad. And I'm gonna, Kishra, I'll hand it back to you here. I'll just say one thing before I do and you can kind of draw Muhammad into this conversation. I got enormously lucky in finding Mohammed um, for several reasons. One is, as you mentioned, Kishwar, he's from Holmes. So when we first showed up at their house, they really, <laughs> I was not the main, the main featured attraction. It was Mohammed because not only did he speak the language and could talk about Syria, he was from their hometown. And then also Mohammed just had this very warm persona that I think put them at ease. And I was, Really, the fate of this project rested in many ways in Muhammad's hands at that point because I had limited ability to connect with them. And in a way, and, and I, maybe I'll leave on this note, I felt that Muhammad would have to vouch for me or be my stand in until I had some kind of rapport with the family. Exactly. And thank you. And thank you, Naji, for sharing that your experiences with us. And I hope we can sort of bring them back into the conversation with you and Muhammad as well. So Mohammed, tell us maybe a little bit more about how you got invited into this project. But more importantly than that, you're then a hinge between Jake and his project and his vision and the situation that this family who has newly arrived, they are in some sense compatriots. You yourself are, had by that time been in the US for what, three years or four years. Um, maybe five, I think I, I'm not very good at the numbers, but um, so you yourself had not been here that long. So you're placed in this very strange position, not only of building trust, but also deciding what truths to tell. How do you decide what Jake needs to know? How do you decide what the family needs to know to build that relationship? Because sometimes it's not just about telling things. Sometimes you have to hold back a little bit. But can you reflect on that a little? Absolutely. I mean, first of all, thank you all for who um, those are attending. Um, and thanks for your time. Um, I think it started, I owe it to, to, um, to Syrian food, to be honest. Um, uh, Jake, uh, when we, uh, I mean, sorry, Chris George, um, he was uh, the head of the IRS resettlement, uh, Refugee Resettlement Agency in, uh, in New Haven, Connecticut, was giving a talk in uh, the University of Connecticut in stores. And I happened to attend, and during his lecture, he was he was expressing and, and telling how they were doing the community kind of interaction with, with Iris, well, some communities will um, kind of host a family. And among one of the, when he was talking, he was saying, you know, one thing we should prepare is house and room and clothes and a hot cereal meal. And he said, um, does anyone know how to cook a cereal meal? And I was the only one who raised his hand. So we're like, we well, kind of, he joked about it. And then when we had, we met at the dinner after, um, it happened that I sat next to him and, and we were talking and he said, well, if you, you know, you're Syrian, you're Syrian, you know, would, would you mind going to Iris to help us translate at some time, you know, would you volunteer? And I'm, I actually liked that the idea. So I started going to Iris a couple of times um, just to volunteer and help with the case managers there because sometimes you need to take some Syrian refugees to the, um, to the pharmacy. So it built from there and um, a couple of um, weeks after I received an email from Chris George saying there is a journalist 
who, who wants to, you know, seek help in, in a project. And I talked to Jake and I, I'm personally interested, um, um, to be honest. And uh, so we met Jake and I, and we headed to the family. Now, to answer your question about how, how I build trust, I think first of all, it just helped that I am from the same city. Also that I am academically interested in Syria. Um, so I know that this family comes with a package. Now, every family in Syria, um, we have fear kind of literally dominates a lot of parts of our culture. Even when you are in Syria, you're taught not to trust anyone. You're taught not to talk politics in the, in the taxi or on the bus, um, not, not to trust strangers that you don't know. Um, and with that in mind, and uh, you're talking about a refugee family who, love, who left Homs, and Homs was the hard hit um, at the time, the beginning with Dara and Latakia. Um, so when I first met them, my first thing I wanted to tell them that, look, I am with you. Like, I know who you are. I know where you're coming from. I'm not with Assad. I'm actually with the uprising. I'm with you guys. Um, and also let them know now directly or indirectly that I am from Homs too, not just by pretending that I can say it. I was actually telling them like, I know that hospital is on that neighborhood, that street has some and so. So I was trying to build connections like, oh, I know that street, I know that place, I know that mosque and stuff like that. Um, so this kind of helped a little bit actually um, build the sort of trust, like he, he, he's one of us um, and he's trying to help. And it, it's personal for me. I honestly like helping people in general. And I think with refugees, um, um, especially because I was helped a lot after I came to the U.S. in 2011. A lot of people in upstate New York and in Connecticut, in Geneva, New York and Connecticut helped me. Um, so I wanted to kind of pay it back um, as much as I can. And this was not for me just as, as a project to be a translator. And I actually made it clear to the family. Like, I'm not here just with Jake to translate. Look, we are brothers. Like, we're from the same country and we're refugees at, at to some point. So whatever you need, any help, you know, here is my phone number, here is my email address. And, and after, aside from the project at different times, um, the family will call me up, but sometimes like, we need to go somewhere, can you take us there? And I'm like, sure. So I will drive and I will take them, you know, grocery shopping or to appointments. So I tried just to, to be um, as, as much as, as possible, a friend, a contact, and also a guide. Because I know when you come to a country with limited English, you can struggle a lot. And I was trying to kind of show them the ropes, like what to do and when to go to shopping, how to behave in, in, in some situations. Um, and, and for me, that was also fulfilling as a person because in the US, I didn't know that many Syrians at the, at the time in Connecticut, let alone from Syria, let alone from Homs, my city. So it was also comforting for me. And I'm not gonna lie, it's not like altruistic. I, I really needed also someone from my city to kind of connect and talk and I also have to owe it to the family. They are very nice. They're very welcoming and warm. And um, I, I can say so much about this. And I think this all added to kind of build the connection. Um, to uh, to um, answer a last point before I head it back to you, or do you want to ask me something? No, 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 keep going, I'm, please. Um, I think something that um, I found myself between Jake, um, who has you know very interesting questions and, and, and a project and the family, and something you said that the country itself, you know, people are traumatized. And, and part of that, that people like to, to speak and to, you know, express that they're witnesses, you know, and witnessing itself, you know, is, is, um, is, is an important thing for them. They want to talk, they want to tell, they want people to understand them. Now, there are so much media that was spoken about Syria and the family didn't know what Jake knows. They didn't know if he is, you know, he's with them, he's against them. Like, who, who is this Jake? So I was trying also to kind of introduce Jake and after I get to know him a little bit, um, um, that he's here, he is there for help. Um, and actually they started talking and, and comfortably. Um, it was not like a lot of, it's not like rocket science. They, they were really kind of welcomed us and kind of, we kind of hit it off if you want to call it at that point. Um, and they just wanted to be understood. They wanted people to know that they are just regular people who are trying, who fled Syria a couple of times. Actually within Syria, they just didn't go to, to Jordan right away. They fled a couple of times within Syria. Um, so for me, having this channel between them and Jake, I, in my mind, I was always thinking that 
I, I should narrate their story. And Jake also insisted on that. And he can talk more about this. He, they, he wanted this to be their story. So I would listen to them. And because of translation, sometimes I was doing interpretation and translation. Um, sometimes you, you come up with a sentence or, or, or a term and I will tell Jake, literally this means so and so, but I think they mean so and so, and then I will double check with them. Like, this is what you said, but if I translate it literally, it would not deliver the meaning that you actually want to deliver. And, and this took that, place- that, By the way, that, that, built, that built trust with you and me, Muhammad, because you're at the mercy with the translator of, you don't know what you're saying and if, if it's all, the fact that you were explaining on a kind of granular bit, this is literally what they said. This is, I think what they said. Can we go back? I've dealt with so many translators that don't do that. And you're left feeling like you're not sure you're getting the straight truth. Um, so I always appreciated that. Yes, I mean, there is this question, as you mentioned of translation, but translation in and of itself is meaningless unless you have the interpretation, right? You need that aspect of giving us the lens through which to see this process that you're undergoing. And it's that lens that I think is also really important to something that you said, Mohammed, is that to be seen. On the one hand, to witness, but also to be seen is such a human quality, right? It's like, I think we gain value when someone sees us and recognizes what we've been through. Um, I wanted to maybe, Naji, include you in this conversation. Um, to tell us a little bit about when you, for example, came to Connecticut and went to school, um, how did you negotiate this, these differences in culture, the difference in your language? I know, for example, you know, there were questions about how even your sister would dress. You know, like there were negotiations that you children were also having to make. And tell us a little bit about those first days, please. Absolutely. Um, so. You know, it, it wasn't easy, it was very hard, especially that, um, you know, with my sister, she has the hijab on, you know, we, we, we didn't have any English back then. Uh, it wasn't easy, even, you know, walking down the hallway, I would have to feel like, oh, wow, if, if I'm feeling that nervous, how would she, if, if she's the one who has the hijab on? So I would, you know, try to, as much as I can to share, you know, with her, the, the uncomfortableness and try to make it seem as normal and it was actually not easy stuff like sometimes we would be surrounded by kids who are coming to talk to us we barely understand what they're talking about like we just smile and nod our heads that's what in most cases happened in in terms of classes and learning that was also one of the toughest things like we the teacher would keep talking the whole day and we didn't understand anything so learning English was, you know, a big part, a big struggle that, you know, once you learn English, then you can learn because if you're not, if you don't know the language, you're not learning the material. So that's what was hard for me and my sister Omar, trying to get comfortable between, you know, different culture and trying to show them the best of us so that because, you know, we know what the media shows, you know, we know what, what, what some people think of us. So it's kind of, it was hard in the beginning. Jake, you can, if you want to continue. I think Kishwar. Yeah. Unmute yourself, Jake. Um, Naji, one of the really dramatic moments that we had um, was, and, and maybe Muhammad, you can even you can even recall, we got a call one day, or you got a call, uh, and it involved uh, a really troubling thing that happened to the family. Can, can you I can you recall how that all happened? I'm referring to the to the death threat. Yeah, Najee, go ahead. Oh yes, uh, the death threat. When when we got the death threat, we were all sitting home. It was after dinner, and uh, it was a normal day. We tried. We we you know we got used to school. Used to my dad got a job, and it's it's going normal. We're feeling good. We are happy that. We're back to, to our normal life, at least. 
This um, is suddenly, this context. This is what about three or four months after you arrived in the United States? Yes, this is right after three months. We we just got to school. My dad got a, just got a job, and we felt really happy that you know we're back like like before when we had we can work, we can go to school, you know, we can do do what we want without any problems. But as on a on a on a after dinner on a day, um, I came home from school. We had dinner, and after that, you know, everyone go back to their, their homeworks. I feel the at the atmosphere wasn't right. Something was wrong. You know, everyone was quiet. Um, then I would go. I find my dad in his room with his mo with my mom, and they were talking, looking at the phone. And I actually asked him. I said, you know, what's going on? I felt like th something is wrong. In the beginning, they told me, oh, it's all, all right, nothing happened. But I guess, you know, they talked, they said, should we talk, tell them and that. And as you know, my story, um, I, I stayed next to them. I said, you know, you have to tell me because since the, the age of 10, since what I've gone through, I felt like I'm one of them. I felt like we have to work together to, to protect our family. So I, they told me that we got this voicemail and I got really scared at that time. I felt like, our dreams, everything just, you know, just broke down. Like all what we thought, like I felt like there was no other place that is safe in the world, you know. And, and just to be clear, Najee, that voicemail was a really frightening death threat in which they knew your family's name, the address, and threatened to kill all of you. Yes, yeah, he, he said my dad's name. He said, uh, you live on this and that, and if you don't leave the U.S. in 24 hours, we're going to come and kill you. Um, and then, um, Muhammad and I went out to your house. What was it like about two nights, two nights later? Um, at that point we knew each other pretty well. Um, but it was a, I remember we brought ice cream. We we're just there to be with the family. It was a, I have to tell you both Naji and Muhammad, it was a strange situation for me because I felt really badly. I felt terribly for you and I felt frightened for you to, there was also a part of me as a journalist that is reporting your story every week in the New York Times that knew that this was an explosive part of the story, but I didn't know whether there was gonna be a way to tell it or whether it should be told. Um, Mohammed, what were you thinking that night? I think when, when I um, got a call from you that the family received some, you know, like a, a death threat and, um, I lived, I think, closer to you than them at, at the time. So I, I just drove away there and, and I saw the family and, and they were just shocked. They were literally traumatized one more time. And with all the moves from um, before, from multiple places in Syria, then to Jordan and then here, and they already were struggling socially and they were struggling getting sometimes like with transportation, getting doctor's appointments, struggling with English. And then you add this up. Um, so we, we just switched to, you know, we, we wanted to be present for them. We want to show that then we, we love them and we care for them. And this is that we are now more than a translator. We are literally friends. We try to show support as, as much as possible. And, and I remember at, at some point, you know, some of the family members, you know, broke up crying and they, when they speak and noticing this shift um, for me, Yes, I'm, I'm there as a translator, but at the same time, um, I, I can understand the depth and the suffering they were going through. So we were just talking and reassuring them, you know, they're like authorities are looking to this. Um, there's some, they, they were gonna do something about this. And, you know, later they, they move out of the house. They, um, so we want always to assure them that yes, people can make threats, they can do whatever they want. You cannot control that, but we are here for them. The authorities are there for them. Iris as well were there for them, the uh, resettlement agency. Um, so we're just trying to show that you have family here. I mean, the family felt isolated. Ibrahim has a brother who lived like an hour away and with limited transportation, they wouldn't be able to see each other that much. So we're trying to be like, we are your family and, and we genuinely care about them, which I really did at the time and I still do. I mean, it's a difficult thing, especially since you've come from when you and and Mohammed, you understood also what it meant to be in Syria, and to understand what the stakes are. Like you said, to be in constant surveillance, to be constantly everyone is sort of unable to trust each other. Um, to sort of understand that mentality, and then to have some event like this 
happen here suddenly sets off, triggers all of those other experiences that you've left behind, mm -hmm. right? How did that feel for you? Did it also make you feel vulnerable um, in some sense, even though you weren't threatened, but? Um, I, I don't think it made me, to be honest, um, but I, I just was genuinely worried because when what you said, it triggers past events. And I remember Adiba, Najee's mother, she was just said like, you know, this happened to us in Homs and we were able to escape. Then we went to this city and then we had to leave our house and we thought only it's for a few months. And finally we find like, we are like in the best place where we can be miles and miles away from danger and then danger is still following us. Yeah. And, and I just tried to kind of, you know, put it as, as I said, like in, in context. Yes, what you had passed, but the, the stakes are different now. Yes, you, you're threatened. And I know it, it felt that way, especially you have young children. Najee was the oldest son, he was 15. So you think 15 and, and younger, um, but it just made me, made me, to be honest, not only in their shoes, I cannot be in their shoes. I mean, there are families that have, they have actually suffered a lot more than I did back home, but it, it did kind of, you know, um, opened your eyes to really, this is a tragedy unfolding in front of your eyes. You know, how are you going to respond? Yeah. Jake, I wanted to ask you, how did you make that decision um, to, because in the New York Times and the serial, uh, your focus was more on the family as a unit and on Najee's dad uh, as the main protagonist. How did you decide for the book? to shift focus. Do you think by that time your relationship with him had built, you'd had more time? Or did you just think also that this is a more interesting story ultimately? Well, you know, it's funny because I had reported the story in the Times for well over a year. And you would think that after reporting for a year, you know a story pretty well. And, but the truth is I had in the Times mainly focused on the mom and dad, Ibrahim and Adiba's perspective. And, but about a year and a year and a half in, Najee's uh, English skills really had just picked up and he was speaking English quite nicely. And the parents also, mom and dad, trusted me at that point. Um, and, and you have to remember every other week, their story is appearing in the New York Times. So it's a strange relationship, but they have been able to see the way that I'm reporting it. They've seen the story play out. So they have some faith in me as a person, but also, they see that I'm trying hard to tell the story from their perspective. So around that time, I started going to school with Najee. I was actually shadowing him at school. If you remember, I went to your robotics class, which was crazy. <laughs> I yeah. met your friends. And then at some point I just said, can I take Najee, have you ever had Mexican? And we went out to that Mexican place in West Hartford. What was the name of it? Do you remember? I think it was Bartaco. Yeah, Bartaco, good, it's good food. I said, and we went there and, and you never had Mexican, had you? No, no, that was the first time. Yeah, and it, and and um and so we went and had a very nice time, and then like a, the next time, your your sister Amal was just kind of hovering at the door, just like I was like, why is she standing yeah. at the door? <laughs> and I said, Amal, do you do you want to get Mexican food with us? And she's like, yes, please. So me and Amal and Naji would start going out for kind of an early dinner, and um, in those sessions, I really started digging into the kids story i call you kids naji even though you're, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're, you're still a kid to me but um but and one of the things that became clear was was that naji had pushed his dad really hard to come to america and his dad was very torn because his mother was set on staying in jordan and and one of these dinners that me and amal and naji had it came up that when the death threat occurred amal basically turned to naji and said all right Najee, you tell, you explain what Amal said to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, she, you know, my, my sister came up to me and she knows I'm the one who was pushing to come to the United States. Um, she was like, is that America that you were talking about? And I, I just, I just was silent. I couldn't, I didn't have anything to tell her. And meaning like, is this the, is this the America that you had promised us? Like the great America? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when I, when I heard that story, that was like a revelation to me because then I understood kind of narratively that this young man who was 15 at the time had pushed the family to come. And then when things went badly, on some level, even if it was just Najee, 
took it very much to heart that maybe he had led the family somewhere wrong. And it, to me, that was just a really powerful coming of age narrative. And I kind of thought maybe this is the focus of the book. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a beautiful story. Um, and in some sense, it's, it's uh, you know, thinking about it through the lens of childhood uh, and how one grows into this, you know, where all these different stages that, uh, um, that, you know, that you go through um, coming from different contexts uh, to speak, you know, from, like I said, from Syria to Jordan to God, Connecticut, uh, you know, which is itself a strange place to be. Even I think for many Americans, it's a strange place to be, yeah. Jake. Um, but I want to sort of, first of all, before we keep talking, I thought it would be good to just invite um, those of you who are listening, and we're so grateful to have so many of you here. We want to give you a chance to also sort of ask us questions if you have, um, and then uh, and then you know to to maybe open it up. Um, I think uh, there's uh, Jake and Mohammed and Naji. Do you want? Should we just go through the questions, um, perhaps? Uh, and the first one is from Karen Green, um, who says that this is a powerful story and a conversation. We're very happy to have you here too, Karen. Um, and she's wondering what category the Pulitzer Prize was in, um, and why there wasn't more of a splash over comics winning a Pulitzer. That was actually. Somewhat it, contentious. It was, it was the first, it was an editorial cartooning and it was the first time the Times had ever won in that category. And it was the yeah. first comic, serialized comic, uh, nonfiction comic to win. So um, yeah, it was, um, <laughs> it, it, um, it, it was a kind of a first in some ways. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I also want to ask a, a, a point that um, Hira brought up, that we're not dealing just well, first of all, you know, uh, okay, before we go there, Mohammed, as somebody who actually is thinking about Arabic as a language that you study, um, how did it feel for you to sort of take this step back and to be this interpreter? How, did it make you think about language a different way, the way that you are materially sort of intellectually dealing with it and then to have this other form of communication with somebody who's so young and so on? So just wondering if you could reflect on that. Absolutely. I think when, um, just to give a brief, um, you know, uh, like background, um, there's what we call like modern standard Arabic, and then we have the spoken, the dialect. Arabic, exactly. You know, Syrian. So um, standard Arabic is what you see in the books and the media and the news, um, what you study in school and language, dialect is kind of, you know, very close to the MSA, the modern standard, but just it's a little bit different, uh, simplified version. Um, I, when I'm when I'm listening to them, they speak it in the dialect, you know, and, and I of course I speak it as well. But what my mind was in in kind of on both fronts. I want the story to actually reflect what they want, but I know that I have to think of the audience. I mean, you are talking to the American people of different backgrounds, different generations, and um, and eventually um, you have to kind of make it true and genuine. But also you have to think about your audience. I mean, for example, when you speak about prison, what would this prison look like? It's, it, there are like millions of prison where Ibrahim was. Um, when you speak about um, the city where they were living, you know, how the streets were. I was always trying to even tell the family um, if, if the family had a cultural, let's say, um, if they saw like a PDA in the street, right? And they will not accept it. Now I have to tell Jake, they don't accept it, not because they are against it, it's because they're not used to it. We don't have that. So it's one of kind of those kind of cultural things where the family itself is very open-minded and it's very welcoming. But at the same time, you know, you don't want to just write it that, oh, we, and the family didn't like this, you know, like we don't want this to, you know, to be in our community. They, it's just something that was very new to them. So it was these kind of challenge channels I was always trying to kind of balance, you know, which one to actually prioritize or maybe both we can prioritize. But I think one of the really powerful aspects of the, the comic and now the book um, really, and for those of you who haven't read it, I hope you do go and, and get a copy, uh, 
is it does preserve nuances. You know, it's it you don't go towards any types of stereotypes. There are no preconceptions about who anyone is or what role they play. And I really appreciate the fact that you sort of are beginning the story, naming everyone, seeing them for who they are. You know, so I thought that was one of the greatest achievements of this project, Jake, um, for all of you. I want to go to some more of the questions, if you don't mind. Um, and I think there are a number of questions about just why you chose the comic, and maybe that's something you could talk about, Jake. But there's a question for Naji about how does having your life told in a book affect your daily life? Do your friends know your classmates? And what does it feel like to have your experience out there in the open? It's, it's kind of exciting. You know, every day you things that you never expected would happen, like the Pulitzer Prize. Um, in terms of like friends, and, and when I say, you know, we have a book that's written about us, you know, they would be like, oh, what is the book about? So it makes me feel happy that, you know, we have this book for our, for our story and that people like to read it. It makes me very happy every day. Um, for like, uh, you know, every time you know, we would get um, a meeting that we have to talk on and uh, uh, a price that happened, we really feel like we accomplished something. Yeah. It, there's a wonderful question here that asks that if you had to write this story, how would you tell that story? Would it be the same? Would it be different? I don't think it would be as good as the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I but, think I'll um, give you a little time. Maybe you will write even a better story. I bet you <laughs> We'll see. I'm sure you would, <laughs> Jake. <laughs> I will say that um, that I always, and I think Mohammed can attest to this, I always saw this as a collaborative project. Um, I almost at times felt like I was helping the family write its own memoir. I mean, I would have to fact check it because I was a journalist. So it wasn't just whatever the family said went in there. But we, we did do it collaboratively, there were times where they would tell a story. So for example, Naji talked about how he and his dad, um, I would have a disagreement where Naji was saying, dad, we gotta go to America, I've got no future here. And his dad was saying, you know, back off, I have to think about my mom. And so then I would go back and say to them, basically when Muhammad was there for these times, I said, I wanna do a scene where we recreate this. Ibrahim, what did you say to Naji? As best as you can remember, word for word, what did you say? And Naji, what did you say back to him? And then we we'd go back through it in a in, in a kind of fact like a fact checking capacity the next time. But it wasn't just fact checking; it was also an opportunity for Naji to say, "Oh, but I also said this," or "Let me clarify what I meant there." Or or Muhammad would say, "Ibrahim really wants you to make this clear." And so, um, you know, I I definitely had a had a, had a strong hand in it as the storyteller. But I saw us working together and collaborating in a way, honestly, that I had never done before because it seemed to me that was the only way to tell the story. Um, yeah. No, I think that's really interesting. I, there's a wonderful question here also, Naji, for you. Um, in asking you, you know, you wanted to come to the US. Uh, what did you have in your mind imagined? And I should say at this point, you know, actually three or four of us um, on this screen are immigrants, like you, me, Muhammad, we're all immigrants coming here at very different times. So I suspect each of us had a different idea of what it is that we were coming to and then what it is that we ended up being in or this place. Tell us a little bit about, you know, what it is that you imagined that you were this 10 year old child, you know, what in your mind was America? I really um, loved coming to the United States and it became something that I, I even dreamed about it a couple of times. Um, it was something like so great and, and so amazing. Like I, I, what, I, what, what I thought when we were in Jordan, like we're gonna go to the US, we're gonna have our own house, I'm gonna have a room and my own window and a bedroom and uh, you know, and the, my future, even though I wasn't going to school, in Jordan for like five years, I was actually, say, you know, thinking about what I want to be when I grow up. I, you know, I missed from fifth to tenth grade, and that didn't even 
was an obstacle me thinking about who I'm going to be in the future. And, uh, you know, it was, it was amazing. I thought it would be, you know, a future for us and yeah. That's beautiful. I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's very humbling to think about, you know, it is, it was about your future ultimately, you know, and that's why this is such a beautiful story also, you know, I think you give us a lot of hope for all of us who've also been here too long, perhaps. Um, there are some more questions there. I think Peter Cole, hello, Peter, um, has a question for uh, Jake. Did you experience, did your experience and you've reported and lived in Israel and Palestine come up in your developing relationship? And if so, how did that enter into the question of trust? And the second question is also for Naji and Mohammed. How did you think about this idea of trust? In yeah, I wonder, like, I'm actually curious, Naji, do you remember when you um, learned that I was Jewish? Did you know right away or was it after a little while of me coming to visit your house? To be honest, um, I remember, you know, we knew that Jake was Jewish at some point, but I, um, I think it was after we really, you know, Jake came to our house and we had dinner, we had, we drank tea. So it wasn't really a thing, you know, and, and since we came to the United States, we knew we we're going to meet different people from different cultures. So, you know, like Jewish, um, Christian, there it wasn't like an obstacle for us. We, we had to be open-minded and people were just I, great. I worried about it though, honestly, Naji, because the person that had kind of warned me about this at the beginning kind of made me feel like, <laughs> like maybe it would be a problem. And then it turned out it wasn't. Your family was incredibly open-minded and welcoming. Um, but I remember initially not, I, I wouldn't say I avoided it, but I didn't go out of my way to bring it up uh, because I really felt like, okay, I want to hear your story and I don't, I want to just not throw any obstacles in there. I didn't, you know, you're careful about it. And then I remember really well a conversation that your father told me that he shared with me, which I really appreciated. And what he said was that um, he told his brother, one of his brothers back in Jordan, um, listen, heads up, when you come to America, some of our friends are Jewish and we were fed a lot of propaganda by the Assad regime. And you have to know that all Jews are in Ariel Sharon. And I think I told your dad at that point, well, I'm waiting to tell you, we have at least one Trump supporter in our family. And I was really, you know, so basically we all have people in our family that, you know, for one reason or another have, and we, but I remember that felt like a breakthrough because at that point there was so much trust and goodwill between us. Um, and I remember thinking almost that maybe I had even underestimated the family, that I had thought that it would be a problem and it really wasn't. Um, yeah. One of the things that's important to also remember is that Syria is an extremely complex uh, place where you have and have had historically multiple religions, multiple, you know, interpretations of there's not just one Islam, there's not, you know, there's been Christianity, there's been Judaism, you know, Syria and that whole region has been one of great complexity. Right. And I think how one approaches the world is seen in that. Right. So, I mean, I think if you recognize that, maybe, Mohammed, you want to say something more on that. I, I think the question of religion was, was never on the table on part of the family. The family just saw that there's a person that's coming and, and he wants to know their story and they were eager to speak and they welcomed him. And you can always imagine how many times we were to their house and how much scheduling we have to do. And every time they were welcoming and you think about tens of times we went to their house and they have to dedicate two to four hours at some time, you know, take more or less. Um, and I think Jake just wanted them to know because I think I have also to give credit to Jake. Jake was very aware of where he was coming from, that he's not Syrian, he doesn't speak Arabic. Um, uh, and he, he will, does not want to speak his version of the story. He wanted them to speak it. He just wanted to be the transmitter. and. That's why I, uh, Jake and I talked a lot about this, that he wants it to be their story. He said, this is their story. And at some points, the family, and, and this is really true, they would think that they are bothering Jake with the details. 
they think, oh, we're like talking too much. And Jay will be like, oh no, it's the opposite. Please speak as much as you want. Tell me as much as you want. Because they thought, you know, we're, we're, we're bothering this guy and it's the opposite. So he, he, knowing where he's coming from and his background actually helped a lot. Um, and the question of religion I never came to the family or even me personally. Um, uh, to be, I, I just knew Jake, uh, it took, you know, maybe a couple of times and I knew Jake through Chris George which for sure is someone I, I love and respect. And um, just, it's a chain actually, you know, it was always, you know, moving forward. I, I, I just want to, one extra thing for context is I've been doing this for about 25 years. I've never done a project like this. I have been following this family with Muhammad for four years. So there's a level of entanglement here and you may pick this up on the way that Muhammad talks about it, that he wanted to be a friend to them, that he would, he, that he would come and help them out when they needed, that we were there when the, and it's interesting. I never asked you this, Muhammad, but for me, it was always a heavy feeling about this because Najee, I knew your family trusted me and was looking for me to kind of be a little bit of a guide at times and help when I could, but I was also a journalist. I'm not a social worker. You know, I, I have a story to tell and I, and I was always, and I, I don't know if I've ever expressed this to you, Naji, but it, it was always like very heavy for me because I wanted to tell the story and I had a job to do. And I wanted to tell the story in a way that your family was happy about and that felt that I did it right. But I also had my own set of uh, standards that I had to follow at the times and I would have to listen to my editors and I couldn't always do it the way your family wanted to. And there were many nights where I lost sleep over it and worried about it and how would the family react to that? Because at some point along the way in those four years, you stopped being a story to me and you started being someone that I care about a lot. I mean, I, I don't think it's an exaggeration, Naji. you're like a, you know, I feel this way. You're like a nephew to me. And, yeah, and, and thank my, you so much. You know, and, and and I'm, I'm grateful for that. And, you know, and there's, I think, love between all of us. Seriously, that's not an overstatement between me and Mohammed and Naji, but it's also tricky at times because we're telling a story and you have to follow where the story goes, even if, and, and, and there's, it's, it's entangled. And I thought to myself, why did I let myself get so entangled in this? And yet on the other hand, and, and I think you might agree, Mohammed, or shed some light on this, we couldn't have told the story with the intimacy that we told it if we hadn't been as close to them as we were. So the whole thing was, you know, was, it, yeah, tricky. But one last thing, I'm sorry to go on and on, but this is about Muhammad. Usually a translator is someone that the journalist hires to do the journalist's bidding. In other words, I'm paying you, Muhammad, do, you know, you're just working for me doing, Muhammad was never like that. He was like a, a go-between between us where I never felt it was clear to me that his loyalty was more to me than the family. But I appreciated that hugely because you were the kind of moral compass in this. Muhammad, can I tell this part of the story? Can I? Like, and, and I, you weren't just someone I was paying, you were someone who I respected and was like a third party to this process. Um, so I, I just think it's really important that that you all understand how complex this all was. Um, but I think this aspect of the moral compass is really important because that is what is at the core of a project such as this, right? I mean, I think it requires trust, but it also requires an understanding of uh, that there's something bigger at stake here. That what it's not just about a story, right? It's about people's lives. It's about their need to be seen, um, to have the story told, you know, like Naji's dad said that this is how I can talk back to Asad, right? So telling the story also had a really important sort of restorative point, point for your family, right? To be seen and to actually take control of the story and the events, uh, right? So, I mean, I think it wasn't, it's not just a story, right? And Jake sitting in here in 2020, this story matters even more, right? So, I mean, I think recognizing that moral compass and Mohammed, that you were the hinge is so important. Um, but, you know, I think we have to recognize well, what, what's at stake is very, very high, more than just the story. Mohammed and then Naji, I want to give you the last words. 
Um, well, I think I think we all came with good intentions, to be honest. Um, I, Jake, and I, and and um, the family themselves, we we had all clarity and, and honesty. And even when situations where Jake would need it to edit some part of the story, and I would communicate with the family, and I was being honest. Look, this part would be in this and this in this shape. Uh, because it's better and it's worse for, for whatever reason. Um, and I think we never hid anything from the family or the family. Everything was their story. We'll, you know, listen to them, write script, Jake would write, and then I will go and fact check it, you know, one time and two times. Um, and, and adding to that, um, knowing that I was also working with other refugees and volunteering with other groups and with the family, it gave me a sense as well, like how this family is doing compared to other family and knowing actually how bad their situation was compared to other families. Because they didn't have the best support group. They didn't have the best situations. Even the town they were living in, in Manchester is not a small town, but it's not a big town um, with not, not many Arabs there. So with all these good intentions, actually, it, it mattered a lot that, um, you know, our first proposed title for the panel was out of translation, a family, right? And I think this is what, what we, we would end up with. And the medium itself, that it was going to be a graphic novel, something that the family was invested that they wanted people to know their story and read it as is, not bad, you know, not, not don't, you know, beautify it, just tell it as is uh, with all the good goodness in them. And I think this is what the product was, it was a really a beautiful product. Um, you know, I value my relationship with them and getting to know you, of course, Kishwar and, and Hira. And I think this is just a, a, a really, really fruitful project that I, I'm, I'm proud of. Actually, it added a lot to my own um, experience with them and, and my knowledge. So again, I have to say thank you to Naji and, and his family and to you all about this. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a few more questions, um, but we've also running out of time. So just for you to reflect on the questions, um, Mohammed was also to think about whether uh, you felt a conflict, you know, sort of, of not belonging in one place or the other. And again, I think at least three of us here can sort of identify with that idea of like, you leave a home, you come here, you're not here, not there, um, but you make a new life, right? You sort of start again. Um, and the question lastly for Naji was that, how does it feel for you um, when you see American kids, for example, who take, this is a question, home, family, food, education, freedom for granted. You know, it's a very different life than what you left behind. Um, and how do you feel about this new place where you are and the children that you're surrounded by or young adults now, like yourself? Yeah, um, it's it, it, every day, everything, every new thing that I learned was very surprising to me. Like the fact that they're, you know, so normal with going to college uh made me feel like wow back home it was you know difficult it's kind of difficult you have to get good grades you have to have money and here it's a lot more uh like it's available and i, I feel like they don't most kids don't recognize that so you know looking at that i feel like the the process and what i've been through made me see those things and i'm it might it, like even if the war and all what I have been through didn't happen, I don't think I would know all that. So I think the whole thing taught me a lot, made me know what should we, you know, that we cannot take everything for granted. College, school, and uh, work, family safety. You know, you can't even take safety for granted. And that's like the least, um, the least uh, thing that people look for. So, you know, after all that, it really made me start to look at things things differently you know I always try to send to people messages of people who uh, are a little close-minded tell them that this is how it works this is you know this is what's going on outside most times they only look at um, certain parts inside the country they don't look outside that's what I think makes um, a big difference yeah 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 no and your voice is very important um, and really again I commend you for you know sharing your story with us and to see you grow also it's i mean i'm like i said i'm personally so happy to meet you having seen the comic strip a while ago and reading the book and hearing about you from jake um thank you all we had promised to be done by now and of course we could talk forever um but i also really want to thank the audience those of you who've been here with us and sharing the story with us 
uh, I mean, sharing this time with us, um, there's a lot more to be learned. Uh, but I think, like I said, thank you, Jake. Thank you, Mohammed, and thank you, Naji. And thank you, Hira, um, who no one can see, but who has been our basic support throughout this process. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Kishwar. It was nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We'll meet in person over sure, food. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Inshallah. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care.